to sit in a big circle because I, uh, you know, it felt artificial to be up here. Can I move away from the mic? <laughs> <laughs> it felt artificial to be up here when I know that at every table you're having these conversations and all of you are dealing with and grappling and have probably found much better answers than I have in your own work. So um, this is what I meant when I said I hope that I'm sure that the most interesting part of this um, conversation, at least for me, will be to really have a conversation. So um, I'm happy to ask questions, but I hope that we'll talk with each other as well. Yes, yeah, I mean, I was just interested because I, I, like you, I'm trying to go on this path and but thinking about what I would recommend other people to do. It, it takes a long time to do what you're trying to do when you go backwards and you're expanding, you're driving around the whole world. And you know, there are a lot of complications in terms of national historiographies and, and language and, and funding. And funding. And so, you know, at what point in one's career does one approach these broader topics in that way um, is for me still a, a question. And the other point, at one point when you were talking about the Chino Poblana and you were saying, well, you know, I let the story sort of choose for me what sort of lens to use. But I sort of think that you need to, there's a way in which you can tell the Chino Poblana story, and it has been told as a national story in Mexico, about Mexican nationalism. So I think that it's not just this, it, it is really the questions we bring to the stories, and then we allow ourselves, like you're saying, to use these different lenses. Um, so the stories don't, necessarily speak unless we are yeah. listening for speaking. Right. right, and again, it's not that, I mean, I was first introduced to her, her through Asian American studies, um, not through Mexican history, which you know is not my not my field. But then, um, and, I, and I would have stopped. I would have stopped, uh, and I would have only had that 19th century perspective if I had not then started looking at um, colonial Mexico and and you know religious history because they talk about her as well but in completely different ways that the Mexican and Asian American literature doesn't so that that was really cool but getting back to your other point so you know one of the reasons why I had started out with that book that was you know just going to be um, mid 19th century to World War II is because it was going to be the second project. Um, and so I could, I felt like I had more of the luxury of time, I had tenure, um, but I still wanted to get it done so that I could get promoted. Um, and, um, and I just also, I was still feeling my way around and feeling, you know, just growing into um, this new identity of not being just a U.S. historian, so I really didn't feel comfortable intellectually saying I'm a whatever, I still don't, but, um, but then it's true, timing is everything. I think what's challenging now is for graduate students, the, the standard is transnational history, and so that does require the language and the traveling at a time when there's decreasing, at least at public universities, decreasing support for that. So on the one hand, you know, in an ideal world, I would say, um, save your transnational project for your second book or make it transnational after you have a job. But in order to get that job, most, you know, all of the jobs are like US and the world, China and the world, borderlands. So I feel for um, today's, you know, generation, but they also, you know, are doing, this is why our field is, has advanced so much, because of the new scholarship. Um, I'm very interested in the last point that you made about the use of history to construct ethnic identities. Uh, in fact, the paper I submitted for this workshop is very much about that. Um, and while in this workshop we're, we're discussing basically uh, new ways of looking at like a uh, uh, the way scholars look at, at migration, but I'm also very interested in the way that immigrants uh, see themselves vis-a-vis <coughs> -vis different trends in, in the historiography. 
So for instance, while in the 60s and 70s, uh, with the introduction of multiculturalism policies, they may have been able to construct um, and use their own history, sometimes in a mythologized way, uh, but in a very creative way to sort of insert themselves in the narrative, national narratives of their uh, countries of adoption, uh, be it in the United States or Canada. And just wondering uh, how currently uh, immigrant communities, uh, if they have adapted that uh, public, the, the use of public memory, heritage uh, celebrations, the construction of their own ethnic identities, uh, if they're adapted to the more sort of global identity, the historic identity, So basically, how has our conversation as academics have influenced the that's another question. Yeah, the, the construction of current identities or, or vice versa. It seems like you're asking more than one question. I probably am. Maybe I'll answer the first the first one that I think I heard, <clears throat> and then the second one about how what impact does it work? <laughs> I might leave to another time. Um, but I, I think I can I think I can touch upon that too. Um, so the, the first one, I think, is about the relationship between um, history, memory, immigrant identity, but also, you know, not just within a national context, but diaspora. Is, am I framing it that way? Yes. So um, I think one of the great examples that I can think of that speaks to that specifically is the Kamagata Maru movement. Um, to recognize the um, shipload of South Asians who came to challenge the continuous journey law in 1914. Uh, uh, it was a real um, uh, impasse in the Vancouver Harbor. Three months, they were turned away. Many of them were then um, arrested by British colonial officials. There has not been, um, there's, there was a kind of half um, apology, but it wasn't in the House of Commons. It was outside. There were people that are very, they, you know, they wanted the, these things matter, right? Uh, where it was, who said it. Um, so there's been a, a local, um, well, it's based in Vancouver, so I'll start with that, a uh, Vancouver-based organization called the Kamagata Maru Heritage or Memory um, Project. And it's about, uh, it's about publicizing the history of the Kamagata Maru in Vancouver and in British Columbia and in Canada um, more broadly. But then part of the project, actually, they collect donations to not only do these public history projects, but then also to send money back to the villages of the Kamagata Maru passengers for schools and, you know, as sort of, remit and not remittances, but um, as, as philanthropy. So there's this, I think that that's a fascinating thing. That's not just about, which I see more in the US, you know, we suffered, uh, we want you to recognize this past discrimination, but in doing so, we also recognize how far we've come and that we are members um, of, the, of the nation. That is, that's a different iteration than I have seen otherwise. So I, so I think that, that's, that there are possibilities of that. I don't see it, I don't, I don't see it um, as much. The other thing is there's a immensely vibrant international network of research of Japanese descended peoples called the Nikkei Project. And um, folks have been gathering since the 1980s as in, in congresses and conferences of Pan-American um, Nikkei, so the Japanese descended people throughout the Americas, where it's about you know collaborative research, but also coalition building, and also the second, third, fourth generation, often mixed race, um, teaching them what Japanese culture, you know, what Japanese culture is. So that's a more diasporic, but within the Americas, not necessarily going back to the homeland. It's a, it, that's an interesting change too. Um, and then in terms of what impact does our scholarship have on identity making? 
I would think that it has an immense impact, <laughs> but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But you know, I, I um, I've talked about in June of 2012 how the 1882 project, which was the coalition of activists and other community members pushing the U.S. Congress for an, it's not an apology, it's a statement of regret, which I think is pretty ridiculous, but a statement of regret for exclusion laws. That could not have happened um, without at least two generations of scholarship that A, started with my um, co-author, Judy Young, who was, when she was interviewing descendants of, um, or when she was interviewing detainees, former detainees of the Angel Island Immigration Station, no one wanted her to use their real names. So in her book, which um, is the, I think, best you know, book on poetry on Angel Island, you'll see the poetry and then Mr. S, or Mr. Lee, or what, you know. So it was such a, stick, a thing of stigma and shame that no one wanted to use their name. Now, when we go out and about, people are coming up to us, they're showing us their papers, you know, I mean, it's endless. We want to tell our story. So, I, you know, I would say that that, the work that the generation on whose shoulders I stand, their work helped to change public attitudes, which then led to, no matter how watered down I think it is, a statement of regret. So I do think that we can have an impact. It might take some time. Yeah. Um, I really appreciate the talk for a number of reasons. As a geographer, I, I like your emphasis on the uh, on the scale, particularly the interrelations among the scale. And it's also somewhat comforting to know that there's another masochist out there mm -hmm. who tackles such large projects. But getting back to scale, I just, I just a point, I guess, maybe a comment on this, is that uh, I couldn't agree more. However, um, the, 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 the relationships, of course, uh, the difficulty is coming up with the, uh, the relevant concepts to understand how scales interact. And, and then, of course, the old problem we all face, data sources to allow us, uh, enable us to understand how these processes work at different scales. And, and, and if you could make miracle discoveries of data and allow you to, to link scales with via the data source. I mean, maybe you can comment on that. So the initial genesis of the project was about um, transnational discourses of race and Asian exclusion. And we had this, we touched upon this today before um, in our group when we were talking about is, um, you know, is Ben's project comparative or is it transnational or and I have found that you have to do comparative project, but you have to do comparative research in order to do transnational research. So you have to understand each national and, and, and by default, I guess, the local, you know, regional perspective in order to then find what the connections are. So when I was um, when I was doing the project or the chapters that focus on exclusion, I'm not, I, you know, I kind of have to spit out. This is what happened, this is what happened, but what I'm really interested in is who is talking to who. You know, I'm, I'm interested in the dog-eared copy of Lothard Stoddard in the BC politicians' papers, you know, and I'm interested in um, any time in Peru when they're saying the U.S. has just excluded Japanese, why can't we? Um, so that, that um, those linkages, but it's about data sources, so it's about print publications, the archival, the archival stuff is hard because it's like finding a needle in a haystack. So that takes patience. Um, you know, and I guess the goal is to not just have those sources where elites, it's easy to find them in government commissions, in State Department papers, in anti-Asian activists, but the challenge is then um, you know, how do you look at transnational So I guess that you know, when I was saying not each chapter has to look the same, when I'm looking at transnationalism of immigrants, it's about diasporic transnational networks. I had less luck finding parallel examples of, you know, Chinese six companies in San Francisco talking to Chinese six companies in Cuba about, you know, how do we resist this? You know, but there are other 
other aspects of, of um, other sources that can be used too. But it's Question, the, the challenges of the tenure clause, <laughs> the problems of um, access to limited grant student funding. And I'd like to put that together with the comment that you just repeated now uh, from your talk about not every chapter needing to look the same, which I think is fantastic. But how do you then deal with yet another challenge, which is getting this book to reviewers who um, may or may not be transnationalists? Yeah and who then are looking for a consistent theme and who otherwise say, well, this is a collection of journal articles and would be better published as such. Right, you do need to connect them. Um, so this last part where it's, um, where I say tying it all together, it's, um, so I guess this is where the definitions really are important, but in defining the connections, whether it's a divergence or, um, or you know, deeply, um, intricately connected. But for me, you know, I chose three um, three main things that I think connect the larger project, and they're broad. You know, so they're broad, like migration, <laughs> um, or um, immigrant inclusion, or exclusion, um, or you know, transnationalism. But but that. They are, you know, each chapter has some element of that and builds on each other. I, um, so Sina Sohi is not able to come here at, to this conference, but her paper um, has a, a great um, um, element to it in that she talks about the ways in which this tension between transnational movements of people, transnational discourses of race that then lead to um, national policies of immigration restriction that both affirm the nation state, but then like I was talking about with this example of the South Asians, lead to more global processes. Um, so I don't know if that really answered your question, but, but finding so I guess in, you know, in terms of not having it look like seven different articles, you really do need to connect it, even if it's at the end of one chapter pointing out what's to come and how similar or different, or at the beginning of one chapter, or even little signposts to say, unlike the case in the Philippine, blah, blah, blah. But also in, in the introduction or in the larger analytical frame, um, thinking about what does connect, whether it's a, you know, from global to national to da 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 da, you know, or if it's this more complicated change and different um, framework. So I don't know if that helps, but I would recommend looking at Seaman's paper in the introduction to see how she does it. Yeah, Connor. I guess this is more of a common question here. I think part of it is that we're talking about sort of scales of different kinds of scales, global, national, local. But uh, I think in sort of trying to negotiate those things, you're inevitably also going to deal with sub-disciplines and crossing different kinds of historiographies, right? So I think inevitably, as you're sort of dealing with these different scales, like, you know, my work, I guess, um, you end up having to, tie, like, one of the things I tried to do was tie sort of American West, North American West history to the history of US imperial and British projections into history, but, but this requires sort of bringing together historiographies that have been sort of traditionally uh, been separated, whether it's U.S. foreign relations and the history of the American West, which David Atkinson is working on, for example. So inevitably, I think trying to deal with the issue of scale is also going to bring you to the question of which histories are you, which, the, you know, of these previously sort of, you know, sort of demarcated sub-disciplines are you going to sort of bring together as well, connect. So, so it's not just a matter of scale, but it's really a matter of sort of which histories you're going to engage and bring together and tie together. That's what I think. The, pr the problem that I see though sometimes is that then once that manuscript goes to readers, they yeah, go to it becomes, those siloed disciplines to yeah. say, what is this other stuff doing in mm -hmm. a book in my field? Yeah. 
But I do think people are open to it when you're explicitly saying, I'm, bring, I'm trying to bring this subfield into collaborative, product, you know, productive collaboration to this other field. You know, and, and I think if you make those postmarkers clear to these people, even if there are in their silos, I think if they're, you know, they would be open to these kinds of collaborative sort of overlaps and <coughs> think, you know, unless they're really like, you know, futile about, you know, marking off their territory, you know, but otherwise I think they would be open to that. But I think you, you but I think you need to signal to the, the readers, even if they are stuck in these silos, that look, this is, these are the fields I'm bringing together, and I think they can understand and see that. But I think it's our job as the, uh, as the producer to, to, to show them very clearly where these connections are going, where the overlap is, and the intersection is taking place, and why it's important and productive. And you want those other audiences too, because if you're crossing so many different time zones, places, and subfields, you want to make sure that you're doing it uh, correctly, or that you haven't missed anything. Um, so, yeah. But I just, uh, there's a practical dimension to this, at least in Canada, uh, at least until recently, uh, there, the funding opportunities to do this kind of research, you have to emphasize multi trans cross interdisciplinarity anyway. So you have to play that game. So it makes sense to do that uh, if you want to get funding. So uh, if grad students are thinking about this kind of research, they have to think beyond the box. They have no choice, but I do think one of these big projects is something I would never, I mean, and it's taken this long for me to feel comfortable going so far outside my area of comfort, too. So it's not. Don't need to, don't need to go. You don't need to go back. But eventually, you know, maybe you'll, um, maybe you'll also find these new horizons. And who knows? It could be a real, could be a real flop. And then, then you won't uh, want to follow my business. Yeah. Um, I guess my my question comes as a graduate student, kind of, um, and and to everyone here, really, as um, thinking about these subfields and, and, and the need, and I think also just the desire to do transnational work, the work that pushes beyond the nation as a container of meaning, um, and the difficulty we face coming through academic programs that are so essentially structured around um, nations as the, the units for teaching, um, and ways and if we, you know, if the train of transnational scholarship and train funding for scholarship and all this is pushing us in that direction, um, at some point, it seems like we need to try to address the the academic structure of our departments. Um, yeah, because yeah, I'm, for instance, funding. quote unquote, an Americanist, and it's certainly I'm not an Americanist. I'm, you know, I'm a transnational scholar. I, my my subjects are in Europe or in America, or in South America, um, and uh, you know, it's I've been lucky to have have faculty that supports that kind of work, but um, it's really frustrating feeling yourself having these. You know, and institutional motivations to get out of the box and institutional limitations keeping us inside the box. Um, and how we as a community of scholars can go forward and try to address that. And you know, one of the things I see on the job market actually, I was saying, mentioning it earlier as a positive, but actually I think it's just more, um, it's, much more it's just another way of labor exploita exploitation in that now you're not expected to only teach U.S. history, but U.S. and world history. Um, so in framing it as U.S. in the world intellectually, it's very exciting, but actually I think it's <coughs> just a way to get more out of one person for the sake of another one. At the same time, and it just as a final point to what you're saying, perhaps for Americans here that may not be aware of this, our current government is actually going the other way in terms of focusing more on the national uh, history of Canada. Uh, in fact, just this week, um, there's announced plans to change uh, what was the Canadian Museum of Civilization or the Canadian mm -hmm. Civilization and which had exhibits that did not relate directly with, with Canada uh, from you know, the, the issues to, uh, having to do with every part of the world and now focusing a lot more just simply uh, on Canada. Uh, the other uh, evidence of that with, which in our group uh, Bruno Ramirez brought up is the fact that a lot of uh, Funding has been cut. Uh, funding that was given uh, through Canadian embassies abroad mm, for Canadian fine. studies uh, abroad, yeah. uh, and that has a significant yeah. effect as well. So, although the, uh, the intellectuals and scholars are going in that direction, uh, 
transnational and more global perspective. Uh, unfortunately, our current government is going the other way. It's you know, very much sort of like conservative. Well, they're cut up in the war of 1812. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was transnational. Unless the transnationalism is Canada. British. Oh, British, yeah. Then, yeah, then it's okay. British world, yeah. David? You know, I've been thinking a lot about this recently, and I think it speaks to some of the practical matters that people are raising. I'm totally in agreement with you about expanding ourselves in this way. But I wonder whether, in some ways, our conceptual innovations are outpacing our capacity to actually do the work, it seems to me. And I can think of a number of projects I would love to do by myself. But I'm in no way uh, capable of doing it. One of these was an early dissertation idea I had, and it was contained, it was lovely. It was 1924, and it was the immigration restriction of the National Origins Act in the United States. And I wanted to know how other countries responded to that, which I thought would be awesome, and it is awesome. But if I'm going to do that, I need to do research in Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Britain, right, and so on and so forth. I cannot do that by myself, right? So, that seems to me like something that needs to be done collaboratively. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that's something we all need to start thinking about is more, not just collaboration in a forum like this, but actually working together on narratives, working together on, and I know that there's tenure issues and, and you know, we don't allow this stuff as we do earlier, but knitting together on narratives, it seems to me, is going to be the next step we're going to need to take to really to meet our own goals and expectations about the kind of work we want to do. So my father had that. <laughs> you know, one small measure is when I started this research, and I'm playing it again, the H thing, but thing, uh, nothing had even been microfilmed. And now as I'm finishing it, it's available digitally. Not everything. So, And that's also a matter of uh, funding and also which sources get privileged in terms of digital um, access, but um, but I've been amazed yeah. at how much is available. Too much. Yeah. So there's small pieces that you could probably yeah. piece through, but then again, but even linguistically, I mean, we I have know. to engage. Yeah. With, we all say this, right? But right. we really have to engage right. with the world of scholars today that we just don't seem to be able to do. Yeah, just, I mean, it, there seems to be like this frustration and this negativity around like, oh, we don't have funding, we can't go around the world to do these transnational projects, but I really, and I, I really do believe in the idea of getting your passport and learning other languages and going to those archives, but you can very well do transnational projects where you live, and I, working with undergraduate students in Portland, I get them to do projects just within Portland of, you know, transnational topics using the sources that are available there. So I think that this methodology or this approach doesn't require you to do, uh, you know, 26 countries in the Americas or global history thing. You could do the transnational approach within one locality and, and do it reasonably. And the other thing I would say is, for me, the, um, like Cornell was saying, this learning other historiographies, it, I think you have to be willing to to be sort of lost and be a foreigner in someone else's historiography. Because as historians, we're trained to be the experts and get this one national historiography, know everything about it, and we feel really comfortable in our time period. And that's homey, but if you want to do this work, it means sort of being an idiot like you are when you're a foreigner traveling to another country and you don't know the language, and just being sort of comfortable being naive and, and trying to learn. And so I think that's a hard lesson for, it was a hard lesson for me to learn, but you learn a lot. And, and going off that metaphor, at least when I travel abroad, one of the key things to survival is making local connections. Mm -hmm. um, and so that might work the same way that, you know, when, when you're dealing, with, and this I think addresses the kind of Cult of individualism that's like embedded in the Western Academy, right? Um, actually, makes me think of that oh, recent Obama's quote, right? You build your business, or like, you know, no one, none of us are actually doing this intellectual work alone, right? We're all building off of the scholars and our advisors and our peers, and all, a huge amount of collaborative work. But making that collaboration is more explicit. Um, so, for like within, luckily within the kind of 
community that I'm functioning with mostly, which is with scholars of anarchism, there's a huge emphasis on that anyways. Um, so for instance, I have um, you know, contacts in Rome who I can get to go to archives for me to help me with translations issues of, of, of complex translation and stuff. Um, and it seems that, that, that those networks, those transnational networks that we have to build as, you know, the way in which being transnational scholars calls us to be transnational migrants as well, um, and building our own intentional transnational networks to be able to facilitate the kind of work we want to do. Maybe just, if anyone has one last question, and then we'll take a quick break for the round table. So we ended up on a, on a good note. <laughs> <laughs> so good, so good note.